Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us both in person and online. As the title of the panel says, we will discuss the role of digital technologies in arts and culture. And it would be an oversimplification to see them only as tool, tools of cultural and artistic production and preservation, given that in the digital society they are at the very foundation of the ways we access, perceive and interact with cultural and artistic content. So in that sense, they open new modes of operation, creativity and critical thinking in digital society. And to demonstrate what the so-called digital turn means for arts and culture, it was my intention uh, to create a diverse panel by inviting experts from different areas and backgrounds in art and culture so that we can hear, actually hear different perspectives on the topic. So here with us today are Dimitri Tadic, Head of Creative Europe Desk Serbia, who will tell us about digital cultural heritage and the role of Creative Europe in cultural material and digital preservation. Um, Tony Maslic, artist and the PhD candidate at the School of Creative Media at City University, Hong Kong. Um, he will show us his research and work on artificial consciousness through new media art. And Boana Matic, associate professor from New Media Department of Faculty of Fine Arts. Uh, and from a theoretical perspective, she will address the problem of critical or emancipatory potentiality in the discourse of new media and uh, new technologies. Nice to see all three of you virtually. Um, so I will. I would. I would like to start uh, with Dimitria to give us kind of a cultural context. Um, uh, actually, European Commission uh, issued a digital strategy which includes digital cultural heritage, and they created a recommendation on uh, recommendation on uh, digitization and online accessibility of cultural material and digital preservation. So, if I understand correctly, it's a, a about digitization of material heritage, but also preservation of uh, digital heritage. Uh, so there, there's an expert group formed on digital cultural heritage and Europeana, and I would ask you to tell us more about that. Uh, and then to tell us about the role of Creative Europe in encouraging and supporting projects, fo projects focusing on cultural heritage digitization. Go. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Yana, for inviting me. And um, uh, my my voice, so I almost uh, is, is almost gone. Uh, it's not COVID. It's due to some allergic reaction. So sorry for that. But I still I can I can uh, speak. And I uh, hope you you, um, you you can understand me. Um, um, yes, it's everything is true what you just said. Uh, but uh, European and, and uh, European Commission in general is very interested in those in those, in those uh, topics: how to preserve uh, heritage and how to how to deal with it. But the the main thing is, and we saw it uh, when uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage was pronounced few years ago, that apart from those goals you mentioned, uh, uh, it's a uh, very important thing is to is how to, uh, to, to, to make heritage alive. So uh, how to, to make it more present in everyday uh, life in Europe. So uh, it's really far from just preserving it and uh, digitalize uh, uh, cultural heritage. It's, it's more, actually the focus in, is on how to make it more alive and more present in today's life. So, uh, the, uh, and this is even more important when we speak about Creative Europe program. We, uh, I'm proud to say that in the past seven years we had a really a successful participation of Serbia, meaning the organization from Serbia, uh, because uh, so many projects were uh, is going on and so many projects are already over. And we are looking forward to, to the new cycle, seven years of the cycle, and we are happy to uh, to uh, participate in, in, in this new cycle. Creative Europe program. Um, so, uh, in, um, and the important thing is to say that, that when we speak about digital technologies, it's again, it's not just simply about preservation, but it's not also about just using digital uh, technologies and just to, to, to appear uh, modern or contemporary. So, uh, the, the, the thing is how we use it. Uh, artistically speaking, culturally speaking, but also in, in terms of the ethics. Um, um, so I would like to, to refer to 
to, to colleagues, so the other the, the previous panelists and, uh, were speaking about, so my dear colleague from the ministry, Maya Zalic, also spoke about the ethics. And that's that's something which is highly important in, in all European uh, uh, main programs, like Creative Europe Program, which is the main European program, EU program for, 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 for culture. So um, when we use digital uh, uh, technologies, it's also about, as, as Maya said, and, and other panelists, it's also about values we are into. So uh, a creative Europe program is also is always about inclusion, diversity, gender equality as well, which is one of the the the, the, the keywords, uh, key terms in, uh, in in new seven years uh, uh, cycle. Uh, in times of COVID crisis, digital technologies are even more important. Uh, so uh, the idea from uh, the colleagues from the European Commission have is to 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 boost cultural sector uh, as soon as possible because we know those these past two years were not not easy for anyone. Uh, so uh, also that goes also for people dealing with uh, with culture with cultural professionals. Um, we can also speak about um, uh, on, on a political ideological uh, level because uh, one also the key words it's it's digital shift it's about digital transition so how we adapt to the modern world and politically speaking uh, uh, we see how much it is important because it's about this sense of, of belonging to, to to the modern so-called modern contemporary world world so and it's it's really hard not uh, not to uh, to feel um, at ease and au courant French would say, meaning to be in line with with a, a modern modern society. If we do we do not use uh, uh, digital technologies, and uh, speaking uh, uh, about culture and digital technologies, it, it's important to to say that there are several levels we can which we can we can speak about about the subject. So first of all, it's about uh, uh, as you said, uh, um, uh, how how we use it to digital digitalize uh, cultural heritage, uh, but it's also maybe even more importantly to me because I deal with creative Europe program, so it's about creativity, arts, and culture. It's not simply about cultural heritage, or exclusively about cultural heritage. Um, so it's also uh, about how we use digital technologies in in, uh, in arts. So there are a lot of, of, of projects under the framework, realized under the framework of Creative Europe program, um, which use it artistically. So uh, we see, we saw so many projects like dealing with uh, using uh, digital technologies, in, for example, in, in theater set design, for example, using real-time uh, films, uh, videos in, in, uh, in, in, in artistic creation, for example. Um, um, creative group program is, this, is, is divided into sub programs, culture and media. Media means audiovisual sector. So, in audiovisual sector, it's uh, uh, gaming. It's also very important, um, and there is even a specialized uh, open call for for those projects dealing with uh, with, uh, with with gaming. And it's uh, uh, I'm happy to say more and more. Uh, um, important in, in in Serbia as well because we see the the, the, the rise of this uh, this uh, these professions and uh, there are many um, organizations in Serbia and more and more uh, luckily which deals with uh, with, uh, with gaming but also it's about how we use digital technologies in, in culture uh, more broadly. So uh, we witnessed projects like using uh, uh, digital tools, digital, digital applications when realizing their cultural projects. Uh, and there are many successful uh, uh, examples of that uh, kind of, of, of things. And um, uh, also digital platforms, even uh, networks like uh, uh, platforms like Netflix also uh, becoming more and more more important. 
Um, but it's also, when we speak about digital tools, it's also highly important how people from culture uh, promote their activities and their project, because the European Commission is, is very keen to see uh, um, uh, or, or how it goes with the, with the visibility of projects. So we know how, uh, because simply it is, it's not enough to just to put the EU flag uh, stating that you are funded by Creative Europe Program or European or whatever, it's also about how you, about how you promote your activities and your projects. Um, uh, so we know how uh, 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 all those uh, sites, YouTube or uh, uh, social networks, are are, are important in in, in that uh, 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 terms. Um, so. Um, as, as, it, as it is stated as one of the, the, the main priorities in Creative Europe program, it's, it's new, te uh, new technologies and the use of new technologies in all those terms I, I tried to, 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 to explain. So it's about how cultural goods are created, managed, disseminated, accessed, consumed and monetized. So it's really a huge, vast, vast area and it's really up to cultural professionals how do they approach this, 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 this topic. So in short, that, that will be it uh, when it comes to, to create a general program. Thank you so much for these insights um, and broadening my knowledge about Creative Europe. Um, I will now turn to Tony who employs digital technologies and specifically AI technologies in his artistic uh, research and production. Um, so Tony, your current research focuses on consciousness and the idea or possibility of emerging artific artificial consciousness um, and you use speculative visualization processes to demonstrate how new media art can actually be utilized for exploring abstract uh, neuroscientific principles. So please tell us more um, about that, uh, both about your academic research and uh, artistic work. Okay. Um, hi. Thank you for inviting me, Jelena. And nice to be here. Um, I have some slides I could show, if that is a possibility. Um, yeah, I think I can also just uh, discuss this. Can, can Tony share his screen? I think you, you can do it now, Tony. Okay. So, uh, I will um, talk a little bit about consciousness in this uh, small discussion. Um, so, I'm, I went to Hong Kong to study consciousness, and uh, I'm, an, I'm a visual artist. I do uh, work for a long time with uh, different medias. In the last five years, I moved more into new media which I rather call post-media arts. New media is uh, technology-driven, and post-media arts is concept-driven, and is using technology in that sense is kind of different. Um, so in this uh, small speech, I will go a little bit about what is consciousness. I will go through the theory of consciousness, and I will show a couple of my works which are related to that, and I will go towards artificial consciousness and conscious cities. Um, so what is exactly consciousness? We really don't know. Uh, that's the very short answer. But there is a lot of theories about it. And I will uh, talk about the theories as they... Uh, I, will I will choose basically one theory which is using uh, specifically evolution and neuroscience as their uh, building ground to understand consciousness. Um, my work uh, is dealing with this subject for quite some time now. Uh, so I will give a little bit of an overview of the work which I was doing. Uh, a work which I did in Venice Biennial in 2014, Architectural Biennial, where I researched uh, the, uh, the end of the currency of the Cyprus uh, pound, uh, the adaptation of the euro, and the economic crisis which was in that time uh, going strong. 
and this caused an emotion towards the audience and the public uh, when they were thinking back about their original currency. Uh, a work which was dealing with uh, nostalgia and emotion and uh, kind of this the feeling of loss. A non-digital work, uh, although it was developed digitally. A work which was made in Vienna in 2016 where I uh, disseminated the piano, started working with uh, objects on it, uh, which were playing the piano and they were driven by microcontrollers and sensors and the audience by even being not touching the machines were basically playing the instrument and they became the musicians. Uh, a work which I did for Athens, which is still a work in progress, it was unveiled for the production. Um, it's a machine which uh, has inflatable bubbles, which is a barometer of the health of society. Uh, if, a, if a bubble inflates, then it is getting more healthy. If, if a bubble deflates, and each uh, bubble has a specific parameter of society, which is measured in that sense. And this whole installation works as the brain of a city. Um, another work was uh, a small work of two little worlds of musicians. Again, it's uh, interactive with the audience. Uh, in the top one, you can see the work, which is uh, the real work, uh, which was reflecting uh, the different uh, ideas. And it was interactive in an installation. The one in the bottom on the left is uh, the digitalized version, which will turn into a VR installation at some point. Um, and, and hereby I, crit I criticize uh, fake, uh, hyper reality, deep fake, but also what can we do to uh, build different kind of environments like metaverse? Is that uh, then a digital environment or is that part of our experiential world? Um, I will go very fast through the theory, so I will not uh, go into the deep. Um, the theoretical scaffolding which I uh, adopt is based on uh, evolution and neuroscience and the three people which I uh, keep as my pe key persons are Paul Schure, Lisa Feldman Barrett and Henry Macron. Um, the area which I uh, adopt as my working field where I get my uh, most of my sources is neurophilosophy and uh, I use myself speculative visualization uh, and speculative research which was introduced by Alfred Nord Whitehead. Um, so what is consciousness? Um, consciousness started somehow uh, when we observe, when we look into uh, evolution around the Cambrian explosion which was the moment that uh, oxygen started to uh, started to become part of the planet. Species which were before that moment, 544 billion, million years ago, were, um, couldn't deal with oxygen, it was toxic to them. And they were much more simpler life forms. They, there was also the density of species on the planet was very little. And because they were dying out, there was space for new species and they started to proliferate. Uh, they needed to compete uh, among each other for energy, for food. Uh, they were uh, suddenly they needed to build alliances uh, as prey or as predator. Um, they needed to compete uh, to procreate. Uh, they needed to figure out how to socialize in order to compete uh, and to survive. And they needed to build strategies for the future. And all these kind of uh, new processes, which uh, sparked the evolution of the brain and, uh, and it needed exponential uh, computational power. And this computational power needed, to, needed the brain to uh, change radically. And the best way to do that in order to be uh, fuel efficient was to develop a virtual model of the world internally in the mind. And I will go very briefly through that. So the competition between species became more prevalent. The brain was forced to develop and socialize, uh, uh, capacity to socialize. It uh, was capable of uh, strategies to survive and adapt to fast changing environments. And the brain capacity definitely to uh, become more complex. 
Um, this created uh, a capacity for the brain to parallelize processes and visualize possibilities of the world. It was capable now to simulate uh, the world internally. And this allowed the brain to simulate and construct possible versions of the world. So we could now uh, have hypothetical versions of the world which we could test out different scenarios. So an entity who had developed that could uh, impose actions into an internalized ver version of a virtual world and could test out different scenarios. Uh, it enabled the mind to make predictions for the future. Uh, also now a big topic in computational science is predictive com uh, coding. Uh, it could strategize circumstances in multiple scenarios, filling in missing data, uh, because the information which was coming in through the senses is uh, mostly incomplete. Uh, creation of inferences in hidden states of other species. Um, this is very important because now we could understand and anticipate other species, how they were feeling, how they were acting, their behavior, and that would help our survival. Uh, and this would happen in both alliances as well as in animus. Um, as a byproduct, uh, by positioning yourself into this virtual model of the world internally, uh, we got a creation of a sense of self. Um, and that sense of self was positioned in that world. And therefore, we uh, developed also the, uh, a sense of our own scale in that world proprioception and that sense of scale also created uh, an awareness of dimensions of uh, distances in the world which we needed to navigate. Uh, we were able to filter unnecessary info by selective focus, uh, only the things we needed for our survival. And this virtual model of the world was constantly optimized and updated uh, with this information. Uh, this virtual model, because it is not in real time constantly information which needed to be processed was much more fuel efficient and could be done by our by the digestive systems of the species which became more and more complex and survived uh, in that sense the evolutionary uh, battle so in this uh, notion of self the simulated world of probabilities um, the birth of consciousness was an epiphenomenon, a side product again of that. And uh, reality is in a way related to that, because reality exists outside us, but uh, is dominated by our unconscious states. And what it really means is that uh, our mind made reality conscious when it was necessary for survival, but it's always incomplete, so we have a, a very skewed uh, idea of reality and everybody's reality is kind of different based on our experience, based on uh, different ways how we interpret the information which we have in our mind. And so this was uh, a little bit the idea of what consciousness is in uh, my interpretation based on the research from the three gentlemen before. Uh, let's jump into artificial consciousness. Could we uh, synthesize Consciousness, because if we have a virtual model internally in our mind, uh, then perhaps we can make a model, an, an object which can make a model like that. Uh, Gray Walter was one of the first people who made the speculators, which was like a very simple machine uh, which could move autonomously through space. Uh, it would react on its information um, around what was happening. And it was very simple, but it was also like 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. And uh, from this information, I uh, formed a hypothesis. If a brain can make a virtual model of the world, which creates consciousness, then could that, uh, could an inanimate object or a machine equipped with sensors, AI, machine learning, processing power, uh, could it be able to make a virtual model of the world, which I think is possible? And if that is the case, then uh, could this artifact place itself in this model and become self-reflective, uh, ultimately developing consciousness? And could it then develop a mind of its own? So this is my question, which I'm interested in. Um, first, I was thinking, I can make an object 
uh, out of electronics and coding and can infuse it with consciousness, but that would be a, a highly difficult task. Um, in order to develop consciousness, in my opinion, we need complexity, information processing in uh, near real time uh, by AI, machine learning, etc. Uh, we need an artificial sensorium, which can be sensors, which can be uh, surveillance networks, can be whatever is necessary. Networks, both digital material, uh, transportation infrastructure, information, communication, energy. And then, of course, uh, one of the candidates would be obviously the internet itself, as, uh, as it already looks extremely similar to uh, neural networks. Uh, complex machines like the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Switzerland, which uh, has also a lot of computational power and a lot of speed to do processing. Uh, but we can actually search more close to our home uh, cities, in this case, uh, Hong Kong, the place where I am at the moment. The more technology we infuse in those places, the easier it is to um, make an assumption that those places might develop a form of consciousness, uh, perhaps very rudimentary in the beginning, but uh, more complex in the end. Um, by being in the city, I started working with arts, and I will go to a, a very small fragment of my own work, which is based on the city, and I will jump a little bit inside. Where I uh, traveled through the city by underground, I started uh, recording sounds, and I realized that the city and the mind or the brain is not so much different from each other. And in that sense, I try to visualize processes of the brain, which are in a way connected to the way how cities are built. And I try to see the city as an analogy of how the brain operates and how in the end consciousness can be evolved out of that. This is a work in progress. I'm doing my PhD about this. And there is another two years to go. Uh, I use arts as a visualization process and speculative visualization process because very complex and abs too abstract and too complex to visualize by traditional means requires a different approach and I think new media arts or post media arts can fill a role in this. Uh, yeah, I would, I would leave it like that. Thank you so much Tony for a wonderful presentation. Um, I will now turn to Bojana um, to give us a critical context of the potential of new technologies. So, uh, Bojana, uh, as a media theorist, in terms of critical theory, how can critique be articulated in new technologies and new media, and to what extent are new technologies used in reproduction of dominant values of society? Firstly, I would like to thank organizers and uh, especially uh, for inviting me to this discussion. Um, uh, firstly, um, I'm assistant professor of uh, discursive practices of art and media um, at the Faculty of Fine Arts and uh, Media Department. And um, regarding your question, um, I must say it is <laughs> easy to answer to your question, although I uh, in general, I deal with uh, uh, critical and emancipatory uh, possibilities and um, uh, implications um, of uh, art and media, because uh, there are many standpoints from which uh, uh, one may tackle this topic. However, um, I choose to follow the path of the well-known but almost <laughs> forgotten uh, critical theory of the trend for school, especially the concept of cultural industry that the dormant or kind of conceptualized in your book, uh, The Dialects of uh, Enlightenment. So when I say forgotten, I, I think of the um, reinforcement of Habermas communication theory after the abandonment of the um, main issues of uh, critical theory. Because in Germany, um, only other students predominantly receive positions at the universities, so that's also a kind of a um, political question. 
So um, the complexity of your question lies in the very um, issue of how we are to define a critique uh, from the standpoint of um, its normativity. So uh, in terms of what are the normative presuppositions of critique. <clears throat> and um, in this respect, uh, I would just like to recall um, recent uh, theoretical work by Henry Gerald Browning, who, who, can, who tried to try to rethink a critique of the cultural industry by employing recent uh, theories of uh, Italian uh, post operaism based on the problematization of precarity uh, in civil labor, post war these uh, conditions, such as Paolo Virno or uh, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato and so on. <clears throat> uh, actually, <clears throat> around 10 years ago, they published a book, um, Critique of Creativity, uh, precarity, subjectivity, and resistance in the creative industries, <coughs> with a contribution by Brigitte uh, Kuster, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, Monica Mokre, Gerald Browning, Kennedy, Oliver, and many others. And um, uh, in this um, theoretical context, uh, the critique is not uh, conceived. Um, as um, just a gesture of global negation or re rejection, but more as uh, author's elucidate capacity for uh, uh, differentiation and for the embodiment of uh, difference. Actually, uh, authors employ various, uh, let's say, recent approaches in philosophy and political theory, including um, those developed by Gilles Deleuze, uh, Michel Foucault, Dudy Butler, Antonio Negri, <laughs> Paolo Vinon, who actually um, advocated uh, for a non-dialectical uh, concept of resistance and critique. They actually established uh, a different uh, conceptualization of a contradiction, a negation, uh, and uh, reaction. So the proposal for a uh, this conceptual development extends from the various figures of uh, life, uh, nomadism, desertion, destitution, withdrawal, to different concepts of exodus. And um, actually, all, all of these concept, uh, concepts have different meanings, but uh, uh, there is a common den denominator, I would say, uh, and uh, implies in a non dialectical approach to critique. So one, um, one of the main theses of um, these authors is that uh, creative industries uh, reinforce a specific material relations of exploitation uh, in the contemporary, I would say, predominantly Western societies. And uh, it is actually one of the main motors of uh, accumulation of the contemporary uh, cognitive capitalism, since cognitive capitalism rests upon the very creativity and uh, jargon that goes like, hand in hand with the creativity, such as freedom, flexibility, and cetera, which uh, actually had been uh, uh, under the supposition excluded by industrial uh, or this capitalism. So this is what actually uh, Maurizio Lazzaretto had in mind when he uh, spoke about uh, taking over uh, struggles and creativity from 68 by cognitive capitalism and movements of uh, an exodus that came out of uh, 68. He actually explained it on the example of quotation of the slogan culture, culture for all and uh, also um, the example of Joseph Boyce, uh, uh, direct democracy dictum, everyone is an artist who actually advocated for a creativity uh, as the main condition for uh, social change in the context of um, uh, neo avant and uh, neo-Marxism. So in this uh, social and semantic recoding, all notions of art and artistic are being replaced, even 
as they are absorbed by the new concepts of creativity and um, creative industries. So, um, in a certain sense, uh, uh, these authors, uh, special, especially Gerald Browning, try to uh, recontextualize the concept of cultural industry <clears throat> by uh, locating the shift from the cultural industry, which coincides with the four distinct of production, exchange, and consumption, cover the conception of creative industries of the present day post for this uh, or information, really, if you want, globalized, predominantly Western societies. And um, what these uh, theorists uh, tried to articulate was a, actually a critique of the, so to say, the reborn, uh, resurgent, and uh, rebranded myth of creation and creators, which goes hand in hand with a new so called creative class. Uh, and also uh, new digital bohemians and similar. Uh, so uh, just recall the famous uh, definition uh, of the cultural industry. Uh, Adorno and Horkheimer explained cultural industry as the growing influence of the entertainment industries on um, the commodification of art. They had the actual skeptical attitude toward the, the new media of re, uh, radio and film and new technology progressivism in general, as they try to, to reflect on uh, on uh, culture as uh, an industry that perpetuates the, the production forces in the Polish capitalist society. Walter Benjamin, for instance, and Battle of Draft uh, had a bit different uh, attitudes toward new and uh, mass media because they um, actually saw both uh, critical, uh, emancipatory, and uh, um, ideological also inclinations and uh, impulses of new technologies. Um, however, uh, according to Adorno and Horkheimer, more, <laughs> let's say, strict theory, the human apparatus is correlated to the apparatuses of the culture, cultural industry. Both consumers and producers appears appear as a slaves of uh, totality of uh, ideology and capitalism. So basically, um, uh, as the culture uh, industry goes hand in hand with the uh, industrial for this capitalism, uh, so two creative industries coincide with the uh, uh, post Fordism and uh, cognitive capitalism. So project uh, institutions of the, the, the creative industries promote precarization and uh, insecurity, as uh, these authors um, maintain. Um, and uh, as Gerald Browning said, most of the people labeled as creatives work freelance and uh, or as self-employed um, and entrepreneurs with uh, or without limited conscience. Somewhat cynically, one could say that Adorno, uh, melancholy over the, the loss of autonomy, has now been um, realized in the working conditions of the creative industries. So uh, the creatives are um, realized into a specific sphere of freedom and uh, of independence uh, or self-government. Uh, so the, the, the flexibility becomes a sort of uh, spotted norm. So that would be my answer to this question, although we can um, have many different uh, ways of um, responding to this extremely complex question. This is one of uh, theoretical options, and um, or let's say discursive uh, options for tackling this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Boyna, for providing us with a critical cultural uh, context uh, of the digital technologies in culture and arts. So uh, now I want to ask you if any, any, anyone from the audience has questions for our panelists or online. Okay, no, I have, I have one question. I think that all of you can actually address it. Uh, it's regarding the VR environments, uh, especially now with 
Facebook's meta metaverse. Uh, I mean, VR uh, is not new. It dates back to the beginning of the 90s, and even before that, the first prototypes were designed in the 60s. But now, uh, what is different is that um, big tech corporations are taking over it. So that's basically tech corporations um, designing our interactions with that environment, with avatars, uh, with uh, artificial agents, um, and actually, how does that affect us? Or is that one question, and the other question is, uh, how does that reflect on art uh, production? This is directed to Tony, because I see many artists are moving into uh, some versions of metaverse, be be it uh, VR chat or you name it, uh, different different platforms. Uh, also, for Dimitri, can you? Um, Kind of reflect on these environments for uh, for culture and cultural practices. And Boena, I, I would ask you to give us another critical view of uh, such uh, spaces. We start with Tony. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Of course, the metaverse. Uh, or the metaverses, because it's not a unified world, right? It's a cluster of different uh, worlds. Uh, there is different companies, and I expect also very soon open source worlds to be uh, implemented, if they are not already there. It's, it's an additional space. It's unlimited. It's infinite, because you can always add new space on it. The digital space is infinite. It will uh, absorb more energy, of course, but it is, it is an opportunity to uh, create spaces. Um, I'm already kind of curious how the uh, metaverse from today will become the, the digital ghetto, virtual ghetto of tomorrow, right? Because we will have now uh, still pretty lo low resolution material. And the 3D worlds which are now created are still quite rudimentary are um, not as not at all what they are promising and i think we we will see a lot of development coming up in the coming time but the equipment is not ready really for it so it will take time for the people to catch up with strong enough equipment arts has definitely a position there it will also have a lot of uh, it will generate a lot of jobs a lot of work for people who are building these uh, 3d environments avatars uh, different ideas, and yeah, time will tell how this will pan out. I think. Thank you. Uh, since we don't have enough time, uh, I will have to cut uh, Dimitri and Boyan. I'm sorry for that. Big apologies. But we will continue this discussion on uh, another occasions, and I hope that uh, we'll yeah meet on different gatherings. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you too. Thank you very much. <laughs>